Okay, I guess we should start this final session for the workshop. We have the pleasure to welcome Catherine Bloom uh, from the University of Boulder, Colorado, telling us about Rosby waves in the San Radatis interior. Okay, hello, can you hear me at the back? Yay, okay, great, hello. Uh, my name is Catherine Bloom. I think I'm a new face to most of you. Um, I'm currently in the middle of my PhD at the University of Colorado Boulder, where I'm working with Brad Hindman, um, but I'm also working with Yuri Tumre and Nick Featherstone, if those names are more familiar to you. And this work is an offshoot of the work that Lauren Matilski talked about this morning. So I'll be reviewing some of the uh, information about the simulation that he presented. I would also like to thank the Isaac Newton Institute for funding this trip. I really appreciate it. Okay. No. So we've all seen a version of this plot many, many times this week, but here it is again. Uh, this, the sun has a differential, uh, differentially rotating interior. Um, the convection zone is, rotates faster at the equator than at the poles, while the radiative interior rotates more or less like a solid body, and the tachyc line is the shear layer in between. So something Lauren mentioned in his talk this morning is that he saw in his simulation, and I think this has been noted in a couple of other simulations, high horizontal velocities in the radiative interior. Do I have a, uh -huh. I have a pole? So uh, we note that VR, which is the blue line, um, decreases rapidly in the tachyc line and is rather low in the radiative interior, which you expect because there isn't convection happening. Uh, whereas V theta and V phi, the orange and red lines remain, they do still decrease in the tachyc line, but they remain high compared to VR in the radiative interior. And the question is, why? And I'm here today to tell you that it's because of Rossby waves, which is what this talk is about. Uh, so I'm going to review some information about the simulation. The code that uh, we're using is the Rayleigh code, which is developed by Nick Featherstone. And uh, it's a global 3D convective code in spherical coordinates. Um, and I'm running it using the analastic MHD equations. So I know we've talked a lot about acoustic waves this week. We're completely ignoring all of those. Um, the equations have been color coded to make it slightly more palatable, but they're <laughs> the standard MHD equations. Uh, we have the momentum equation, which has all of your normal buoyancy, pressure, Lorentz, and viscous terms, along with a Coriolis term, because this is in the rotating frame. Our thermal equation is in terms of entropy. Again, standard conduction, viscous heating, ohmic heating terms. This Q is an internal heating term that is meant to approximate radiation moving through the core. And then finally, we have the induction equation, which we're all very familiar with, and our mass flux and solenoidal constraints. So I'm running Lauren's simulation, so to review, if you missed the 9 a.m. talk this morning. <laughs> it is a simulation that runs the upper radiative interior uh, coupled to the convection zone um, from half a solar radius out to almost the photosphere because we don't want to mess with radiative transfer um, along with these fluid par parameters, which I'm not gonna linger on too much. And this is the main result from Lauren's work, which I'm repeating here because it is important to what I am doing. So he noted that in the hydrodynamic case that he ran, you have differential rotation in the convection zone and also in the radiative interior, whereas in the MHD case, the convection zone is still differentially rotating, but the radiative interior is rotating more or less like a solid body, and this is because the magnetic field is generating a torque that is forcing the radiative interior into solid body rotation. And this is really important for what I see because it makes the Rossby waves look much, much cleaner. So I will be focusing uh, in this talk today, mostly on the MHD case. I'll touch on the Hydra case briefly at the end, but because of the differential rotation, it looks significantly weirder and is much more difficult to interpret. So we've been talking, I, well, I keep saying I'm gonna talk about Rossby waves, now we'll actually show you <laughs> some spectra. But first, um, we've talked a lot about Rossby waves this week, but uh, I figured I would take a moment just to explain them because it's a Friday afternoon and it's been a long week. And also, and it's, it's an excuse to show lots of pretty pictures. So <laughs> Rossby waves are global scale 
um, oscillations that arise from the conservation of potential vorticity. The ones I'm focusing on today are Rossby waves that occur on a spherical shell, um, but I will probably be touching on thermal Rossby waves at the end, which have a different geometry. The most well-known example of a Rossby wave is a jet stream. So this is the picture that I keep in my head from my physical intuition. Um, they have also been observed, we haven't talked about Rossby waves on planets at all, but they have been observed on Jupiter. There's this little white band here of chevrons. It's really hard to see on the projector, um, but it wiggles up and down like a Rossby wave. And I've also included this image of Saturn because it has been conjectured that the hexagonal polar cell is a Rossby wave embedded in some sort of polar jet. Mostly this is just an excuse to show a picture of Saturn because Saturn is always pretty. So in this case, um, the conservation statement for this geometry is the conservation of the radial component of the absolute vorticity. So you have the curl of the velocity, which is your vorticity relative to the rotation of your body. And then you have this component, which is the radial component of uh, the contribution from the rotation of whatever body it is. And that varies with latitude. Theta, in this case, is co-latitude. So the general idea is that you want to conserve this quantity, and if you displace a fluid parcel in latitude, if you, for example, displace it towards the pole, you are more closely aligning it with the rotation axis, and that is going to increase its vorticity. We don't want that, so that induces a vortex to spin down the fluid parcel uh, and reduce the vorticity back to the original amount. Uh, and conversely, if you displace a fluid parcel towards the equator, you are decrease, decreasing its vorticity, uh, and so that induces a vortex to spin up, and these all generate larger scale flows that displace the next fluid parcels and so on, and you get a giant Rossby wave. So this is the geometry and the picture that I always keep in my head uh, when I'm thinking about these. Um, so just a very brief review. Uh, the eigenfunctions are spherical harmonics, which, which you've heard a lot about. And then I am going to be working with this dispersion relation, which is the 2D hydrodynamic solid body rotation dispersion relation. And we will be talking about more than just the sectoral modes, which is why I have written out the entire thing here. Uh, we've also seen this plot a lot this week, but just to remind you, Rossby waves have been observed on the sun. Um, I know we heard a talk yesterday from Santiago Triana about a bunch of different iner inertial modes, but um, as far as Rossby waves go, we've, only the sectoral modes have been observed, and they've been observed at the surface. Um, and the modes I'm going to be talking about are not at the surface, and in fact, live in the radiative interior. Which brings me to my next point. There was some work done in 1986 that showed that there are two different cavities for Rossby wave modes, um, one in the convection zone and one in the radiative interior. And the modes that I am seeing fall into this category. So I wouldn't expect to observe them. Um, and they definitely seem to be living in the radiative interior and evanescent in the convection zone. So I think they are a very different class of Rossby modes than the ones that Yuto Becky spoke about earlier this week, um, for example. So I think this is just a different category entirely. OK, finally, on to some power spectra. I've been talking for 10 minutes, and we haven't gotten there. Um, so these are the power spectra in radial vorticity um, with frequency on the y-axis and azimuthal order m on the x-axis. And this is integrated over latitude, so all of the different L values are present. Um, and there are two spectra, one at the base of the radiative interior at about half a solar radius, and one in the tachycline at about 0.68 solar radii, and we can see that this, this looks great. This looks like a Rossby wave distribution. I'll also note that this is eight realizations of about 270 rotations averaged together, so this has been smoothed significantly through averaging. Um, but we can see the black dots show the analytic dispersion relation that we would expect. Um, this is, again, the hydrodynamic case in solid body rotation, um, and this is a magnetic model <laughs> So the fact that this works incredibly well is very nice for me. Um, but we can see the sectoral modes here, which we have talked about a lot this week. Um, this next line up is the modes where you have one node in latitude, where L minus M equals one. This is where L minus M equals two, three, and so on. So they're all present. All of this is Rossby wave-related power. I've just not um, overplotted the dispersion relation to keep it from getting too messy. So at the base of the radiative interior, 
this is incredibly clear, and it works really, really well. So even though this is a magnetic model, they're really behaving hydrodynamically. If we move up into the tachycline, they're still there. You can still see a couple of, a couple of the ridges, um, but the power is being washed out by this um, zero, zero frequency background feature, so they're a little bit more difficult to pick out. I will also be showing a couple of line profiles. So this is the M equals two cut, this black box, um, and where this peak corresponds with this bit of power and so on, and the black dashed lines are the theoretical dispersion relation that we expect. And we can see, again, there is a lot of power in these modes, and almost all of the power in radial vorticity at this depth is in Rossby wave modes, um, which is, really is an indication that these large horizontal velocities we're seeing are Rossby wave related. Uh, so we can pick out one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven peaks before they end up falling below the frequency resolution. Um, and we can see that from this plot that there is a little bit of a shift from what we expect in the dispersion relation. Some of this can be attributed to the fact that uh, what I've used to calculate these black dashed lines is the frame rate of our, of our simulation as opposed to uh, the rotation rate of the actual sh shell at this depth. And some of it is also that the radiative interior is still rotating differentially a little bit, like two nanohertz. Um, and that is enough to cause shifts at uh, high M values, which is, I think, what we're seeing over here. Uh, so next are line spectra and the tachycline. These are much less helpful um, and much less nice because there is a lot of extra activity in the tachycline. So we can still see a couple of peaks, but they're being washed out by this large power. So if we want to take a look at the radial behavior of these at all, um, radial vorticity probably isn't a good variable, at least in this simulation, just because there are a lot of other motions present in the tachycline and in the convection zone that are washing out this Rossby wave um, behavior as we move out uh, into those regions. So with that in mind, I've plotted some pressure spectra, which are very, very clean. Um, so this is the same spectra as before, just in pressure in the radiative interior. It looks really, really nice. Um, but because pressure is just a much less noisy variable for us, um, you can actually still see some of the Rossby modes well into the convection zone. This particular spectra is um, something at like 0.8 solar radii, and you can see, it might be hard on the projector, but the sectoral modes are present here. This ridge matches with that one over there, um, and there's also a couple, this frequency here is also Rossby wave related. So, picking out a couple of frequencies that are handy um, and integrating over power and plotting that over a band of power and plotting that over radius to get this plot. And this to me really shows that these modes are living and resonating in the radiative interior. Um, this, these are three different modes. This is a sectoral mode and these two correspond to the two on the left over there. And they are definitely living resonating in the radiative interior and clearly evanescent in the convection zone, which is what makes me think that they are part of this separate class of Rossby waves um, than those that have been uh, spoken about earlier this week. Um, so this is the main result. We have Rossby waves. They're in the radiative interior. Um, they seem to be having a nice time down there. Um, and it is really surprising that our dispersion relation does really well. This is a complicated model. It was not designed to look for Rossby waves at all. It's 3D global convection with a magnetic field and, dif and it's differentially rotating. And because the radiative interior is rotating like a solid body, we get something that is incredibly simple compared to the complexity of the rest of the simulation. So for comparison, this is the hydrodynamic case. It's the exact same, exact same model, um, just no magnetic field. Data is processed in the exact same way. And you can see there are some sectoral modes here, but then the rest of this is much less clean. Um, it's differentially rotating, so there are most certainly critical layers, which I think Yuto talked about earlier this week. Um, and I think there are potentially some of the inertial modes that uh, Santiago Triana mentioned um, yesterday that are also present in this model. There are a lot of things that are more complicated than our nice, basic equatorial Rossby wave modes present in the hydrodynamic case. So it, it, it's a, for once, a magnetic field makes things easier, which is a surprise. Um, so 
This is the main wrap up for the classical Rossby wave part. We found them in the radiative interior. They explain the large velocities that we're seeing because almost all of the power is located in Rossby wave modes, particularly in the radiative interior. Um, and, they're, and they're evanescent in the convection zone. And because I have a little bit of time, I'm also gonna talk about thermal Rossby waves. They've come up a lot this week, um, but I think this visual is really, really helpful. So thermal Rossby waves, come up all the time in simulations, but they haven't been observed, and our simulation is no exception. I will show you the spectra on the next slide. But thermal Rossby waves, it's still conservation of potential vorticity, but it's a different geometry, and so it manifests itself in a different way. So this is the conservation statement, um, and in this case, you also have a density term and a length term. As you probably know, convection aligns itself into Taylor columns when it's rotating, and if you displace one of these columns uh, inwards in radius, you are increasing the density and increasing the length scale. And so that column has to spin up to keep this quantity the same. That then displaces the next column outwards, which will decrease the density and decrease the length because you have less length across the arc of your sphere. And so that then causes that column to spin down and so on. Um, and so this is a model, not a model that I ran, but a model that Brad ran back in 2020 that is barely supercritical, and it really clearly shows um, these thermal Rossby waves or banana cells or overstable convective modes. They have many names. So we also see these in our simulation, um, and that's the spectra. So the spectra is also pressure. This is in the TACA Klein, and this prong here, that's prograde, are our thermal Rossby waves. The black, the black line is a dispersion relation um, that Brad came up with for a different model that has a slightly different depth, which is why it's not exactly the same, but it's mostly there, enough for a proof of concept. And I really like this plot because it also shows these are all equatorial Rossby wave related frequencies down here, and I like that you can see both. Um, so that's all I have for you today. A nice short talk for a Friday afternoon, um, and I'll take questions. Now it's time for your question. Yep. Oh, this is extremely interesting. Um, do, do you have an idea of where the kinetic energy of these Rossby modes uh, is in the relative zone? Like where? Because it looks like you're dealing with a very thin shell. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't looked into that yet. Um, what, can you describe exactly, exactly what you mean? Uh, because uh, you would, uh, you, I think what you have is that uh, the amplitude of these modes is very localized in radius, mm -hmm. probably close to the to the underside of the taco climb, mm -hmm. probably, and and it's a very thin. Uh, yeah, I say that because uh, uh, your L minus M, mm -hmm. uh, larger than zero uh, modes, mm -hmm. match very well the dispersion relation. So that means that it's a very thin. Yeah. yeah. I will. I'll have to look into that and get back to you. Yeah. Other question? Yeah. Johannes. Yeah, I'm interested in how you actually get to the spectra exactly. So when you say you look at the pressure, what exactly do you do? Do you look at the pressure at certain points? What do you do? Was it is it a mean pressure or what? Um, so pressure, uh, I mean, really is a spectral code, um, and I. So you look at the spherical harmonics and then. Yeah, it's spherical harmonic components. So it's outputting pressure at the relevant time steps um, in the spherical harmonic decomposition. Um, so that's what this is, not this plot, but another one. Okay. That was a very nice talk. It's nice that for once the magnetic field makes things easier for you. Yeah, I mean, that it's never great. happens. Um, but is it strong enough to actually affect the frequency of the Rossby waves? It seems not. You'd expect it to maybe split the frequency. Yeah, it, it hasn't, particularly in the radiative interior, it doesn't seem to be having an impact at all. I did, I did look into that. Um, and even, I don't have them here, but I do have spectra of the magnetic field. And 
there is some interaction between the Rossby waves and the magnetic field, but it's probably nonlinear, and it absolutely pales in comparison to the dynamo magnitude. Um, so, and they certainly seem to be behaving in a hydrodynamic way. Um, I think maybe, maybe up in, um, I'm looking, working on digging into the Taka climb some more, and there mm. might be more of an impact, but um, not much from what I've seen. Okay, thank you. Yes, so I'm a little bit interested in why there's a cavity and why the, um, for the L is equal to M is equal to three case, it appears to drop so fast in the convection zone. Um, I, can you repeat that? I'm sorry, it was a little so, bit so, quiet. So, so why is there a cavity and why does it depend, why does the L is equal to M mode drop so quickly in the convection zone? Um, so I think, the, the L is equal to M. So in terms of the two different cavities, the raw two wave modes that live in the convection zone tend to select for L equals M. So I guess I'm a little bit confused. Are you talking about this plot here? To be honest, I'm not sure. Um, they're all, the sectoral, the L equals M mode and also the tesseral modes as well are all dropping really quickly. So um, I'm not, at least to my eye. <laughs> um, but I'm, because th this, this one here, the green one, is the L equals M. Um, and it starts, I mean, it starts off at a lower magnitude anyway. I'm sorry, I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> Any other question? If not, let's thank Catherine again. Thank you very much. For this <laughs>